led us to believe that this was something that was airborne and had to be hitting us from the air. Now, the California Air Resources Board did do a number of tests to see if any of these chemicals over time, and they weren't doing it because of us, they were doing it out of curiosity, but they did run some tests to see if any of these um, chemicals were coming over from China. And what they found is, if it was, it wasn't in any great quantity, and for the most part here in Mendocino County where they had one test site, there wasn't anything coming over. So that led me to believe that it had to be over us. Something had to be happening that was happening here versus maybe somewhere else coming in from the Pacific. So that sent me off to look at government documents on these chemicals, how dangerous they were, where they were being used, factories, everything. And what I found out was that we were having these spikes here and we have no industry between uh, the Pacific Ocean and Hawaii and where we are here in Mendocino County, there wasn't any industry um, and the few industries that were small and, and weren't consequential because they didn't release anything that would look like um, the massive amounts of lead and iron and barium would not be coming from those particular plants. Professor Gregory Benford in um, 2006 was on KNBC and um, interviewed on television for uh, in Burbank, California. And what happened is he said that you can mix aluminum and barium and you can make clouds and that he saw it coming that they would be able to put these clouds where they wanted them to do what they wanted to with them. And he's part of the geoengineering group that I was present at when they had that meeting at NASA Ames. The second thing is that I started to look at other programs that the government was doing, atmospheric uh, testing programs, other things, not related to the jets. And I began to find that these chemicals were being shot up on the space shuttle and shot up on rockets, and that they would send canisters packed with uh, sulfur hexafluoride, which is a man-made chemical which exacerbates global warming, barium, aluminum, trimethyl aluminum, uh, strontium, lithium, and they would uh, send the canisters up, release them at different levels in the atmosphere, and to do ionospheric testing, they would superheat them till they exploded, and then they would do these chemical reactions, much like um, explosions you would see from uh, light shows and things like that. You'd, you'd have this big explosion, and then you would go through, and these chemicals would blow up and intermix. So the barium, I began to think that were these coordinating, these atmospheric tests, were they coordinating with the spikes in California and other areas? And I believe that from some of the data that I looked at, trying to correspond the dates of the tests, when they were done, and also the water data and the air data, I think that some of these could have actually added to the water pollution in the state of California airborne because this would come down. Now, a lot of people have associated the jets with releasing different types of chemicals. I do know from the EPA that there's a whole host of chemicals, jet fuel emissions, and they're highly polluting just like automobile exhaust. Carcinogens are involved in them. Um, they have, uh, they deplete beneficial atmospheric ozone. Uh, they have crop damage associated with them. Uh, some of the, some of the chemicals, um, are involved in short-term memory loss, other things. So we do know that in this plume, it's not benign water vapor and ice crystals. But I could never find any documentation which would say that anything else was being sprayed. And with all these other chemicals being used in other government programs, it would be very hard to make a correlation unless you actually got into the plume and took a test. But since most of the plane, planes that are leaving these big, huge plumes are military airplanes, you can't fly in that airspace, pilots would be arrested. And it would be extremely dangerous to get into that airspace under Homeland Security rules and regulations to be able to take the test. So another, having to take a test at altitude and in other areas, it makes it very difficult. The government has not expressed any interest nor have elected officials in actually putting the subject to rest by, by testing these plumes either. So what they do is NASA, NOAA, a lot of studies, university studies, they look at these plumes and say, yes, these are man-made clouds, they don't say how they turn into man-made clouds, uh, if it's chemical or whatever. And then they discuss the fact that in these clouds,
that it's causing certain types of problems, covering us in cloud cover, dimming the sun, it's, um, and then it's changing our climate and, and negatively impacting natural resources. The spiking in these chemicals, uh, the state of California and all water districts across the United States and the EPA all require water testing, and they test for chemicals in the water that are hazardous to human health in some way. If they figure that a chemical is not hazardous to human health or animals, etc., they normally don't test for it. But the minute that they think that it's going to get up above a certain level that it would be injurious, they test for it to make sure that they try to keep it below that standard or to keep it out of our drinking water supplies altogether. So the concern is that when we're seeing these spikes over stated health, you know, when they go up above any acceptable level that the EPA has put in place for these chemicals, we know they're dangerous, they're going to have a human health impact. And they're going to have a human health impact on animals, uh, humans, uh, anybody that is coming in contact with these chemicals. So this is what we know is that the EPA and all these government agencies wouldn't be testing unless there was a problem. What impact they're going to have is each chemical has a different property to it, and they have synergistic effects. So it's hard to say that if you are exposed to a whole source of chemicals, what the synergistic effect. In other words, each chemical will have one property. Uh, for example, barium can raise blood pressure just as one. But when you combine that with other chemicals, then what kind of, what kind of reaction are you going to get? How much are you exposed to, etc.? So we have that element of it. But persistent jet contrails, on the other hand, are, are changing our climate and they're changing the agriculture part of what's going on with us. When you change the climate and you change the microclimates and you put in more cloud cover, you're going to lower crop production. And they know this from University of Illinois corn crop studies, that if you have normal rainfall but you have more cloud cover, crop production drops. In areas where you had direct sunlight mixed with normal weather, then you would have increased crop production. So just putting and saying that these are ice crystals and water vapor, it's benign in the environment, not true because it can heat us up. It can change the amount of sunlight reaching the earth, so it can affect the health of crops, um, health of your trees, because without photosynthesis, trees and plants can't grow strong enough to produce. And uh, you need all of this. So to say that we're going to cut off the sunlight by either geoengineering or through allowing these persistent jet contrails to keep persisting, what we're saying is we're changing our climate, we're doing a geoengineering project, and it's going to have consequences on our food supply. Any chemicals added would have consequences on our water supply. So there's a broad impact here. So whether I know what, what if jets are spraying anything in particular, what I do know is that they're already harming the environment and that there's a lot of studies that talk about the impact in coming years will be tremendous. In some cases, they don't know what the effects are. They want to experiment, and they ad readily admitted that. That was one. Two, they want to be able to continue with their work because that's job security for a lot of university professors. Three, um, several of them have stated, well, you know, the public, we're going to be, we're going to be who the world turns to when global warming becomes this big problem. They're going to ask us to, to save the world. We're going to be the new stewards of the environment and our programs are going to be the ones that will be initiated to save the world from global warming or whatever catastrophe. So therefore, we have to experiment now, get the funding and experiment now or continue our experiments so that we are ready to be the new stewards of the environment. But the problem is when you start putting up chemicals and you start doing atmospheric experiments, you start to impact agriculture, food supplies, watersheds. You start to impact everything that we depend upon for um, life on Earth. And what happens if their programs go awry? And when they were asked this, they said, well, then, you know, you know well, you're, it's just an experimental program. You know, well, if, if someone gets hurt or harmed, well, so what? Their, their attitude was very cavalier about this. 
And Professor Benford actually wrote a program about the Arctic, and they said in, in, his, in his article, he even said, well, if, if something goes wrong, why, it will wash out eventually in the long term. And if you, if you have to sacrifice a few people or an area like the Arctic, then that's okay because it's all in, in the realm of scientific study. So it's, it's a fascinating article to read. I think it's actually the, the, the underlying cause of all of this and some of the funding is military funding because the military wants to be able to control the weather. The military has got an agenda that if they control the, the, the weather, they can control any country to make it do whatever they want. And many documents, uh, owning the weather 2025, um, there's several documents in which they talk about how it, rather than having some weapons of mass destruction, in other words, bombs or something, if they could control the weather in a country, they could actually force them and say, look, we will put you in drought. We will put you in floods. So some of the experiments with the weather modification and other things that the geoengineers are doing would mean that they would have, it would be a military application and a lot of money comes from the military se sector for this. I've looked at some of the universities and I looked at the funding chain, uh, in other words, who's, who's funding these, because it has to be public and we know that the military is also initiating programs and paying for funding. So when you look at the funding stream, you can see that it's private corporations, you can see that it's the military. So there's a lot of funding in there that's not coming from you and I because we couldn't afford it. And the big uh, military budget is where there's a lot of extra money for experimentation. So that's where a lot of the funding. And then it's, it's private corporations who will make money from these experiments going in and will produce whatever's needed to do these experiments. So that funding is coming in. It's like the, the CRES program, the Air, C -R -R -E -S, th when they were sending up these canisters in, in loaded with chemicals to superheat, well, that was a NASA budget, that's the U.S. Air Force budget, and then they do ionospheric testing. Well, how do we know what impact that had on the environment that protects us around the Earth? We don't really know. We just don't really know. The first thing that we started to notice about jets and, and these engines is they would leave a small contrail, very small. You, you would see it behind the plane, it would disappear within seconds and be gone. All of a sudden, this new phenomenon began to appear somewhere in the late 1980s, as far as I can document from Mendocino County, looking at pictures and weather documents and uh, cloud pictures, old cloud pictures. All of a sudden, there seemed to be a time when NASA and other agencies began to realize that contrails were beginning to persist. So NASA started studying um, jet contrails, and they started to see that they were persisting for up to 20 hours. Um, they could cover 4,000 square kil kilometers. So they could cover huge areas, one contrail this is. So NASA studies began to show that they were exacerbating warming starting in the 19, around 1975. They began to show that there was a new phenomenon which they didn't have before, had not seen before, where these contrails persisting uh, rather than dissipating very quickly began to be something that they talked about, studied, etc. We don't know, in other words, why they began to persist. This is one of the curiosities here. And we just know that the studies, that they were studying them, but they didn't study what they were composed of why they would be forming and, in other words, expanding to such huge sizes. But my curiosity with NASA became that when they were talking about persistent jet contrails, they didn't talk about the fact that there were all these different varieties. In other words, one side of the jet having one type of contrail, the other jet engine on the other side leaving a different type of contrail. One would dissipate quickly, the other could leave a large plume. We had black contrails that we were, we were seeing here. We had uh, contrails that would turn into, it looked like toothpaste on a, on a tube. And when you saw these, we call them, I call them toothpaste trails. When we saw them, what we noticed is that they would dissipate relatively quickly. They'd break up into unusual configurations. So what I did is, in order to have people understand that 
what they were looking at were different types of trails that had different dissipation rates or would turn into haze, and also that these contrails that we were seeing would turn into different types of man-made clouds.